ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Solomon has constructed the temple. The temple of the Lord. God's presence is no longer going to dwell in the tabernacle, but now the temple of the Lord. And hundreds of thousands are gathered around. And Solomon prays his prayer of dedication. And fire falls from heaven and consumes the altar right there. And then a 100,000 people are allowed to see the Shekinah glory of the Lord. The, the cloud and the pillar of fire enter into the temple. And everyone bows down low and begins to worship. In fact, it says the priest, you can imagine how timid and scared with trepidation. They wait and they wait and they ask, when can I go into the temple area? If only we could be there. You see, we long to see such amazing things. And yet the reality is, is that Old Testament saints longed for our day. They longed to have the permanent indwelling Holy Spirit that you and I gathered here this morning are the living temple of God, permanently indwelt with his spirit, that he meets with us in a special, unique way that they longed for and that you and I have the promises of. Last week, Daniel gave us an incredible introduction to the Holy Spirit. The scene in John 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus says to his disciples, it is better that I go away so that you can have the Holy Spirit who's going to indwell you, who's going to empower you, and who is going to bring unity to us. Now this morning, we're going to begin to look at spiritual gifts, as we try to develop a theology on engaging the Holy Spirit. You have a QR code uh, on your uh, pew right there that is a link to a spiritual gift test. The only thing I ask is that you do not take it during the sermon. Okay, you have plenty of time to do that. Afterwards, I'm going to refer to that at the end. Also this morning, uh, we're going to be looking in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you will turn with me in your Bibles there. I'm going to be teaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but I'm also going to be pulling from a number of other uh, passages talking about spiritual gifts. Now, I know some of you here this morning, you hear the pastor say spiritual gifts, and you're a bit surprised, saying, well, Baptist, uh, they don't normally talk about that. I'm going to take notes this morning. While others of you hear that and you go, yeah, fight, 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 fight. Because you know the explosive nature of divisions that commonly occur over and around the supernatural gifts. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you this morning. You will not find me explosive or polarizing, okay? In fact, I need to make a few quick points in areas, uh, clean some things up so that I'm not hijacked by polarizing issues whenever I get to those issues. I'll just state it plainly up front. I am not a cessationist. A cessationist, that meaning is those who believe that all the miraculous gifts have been done away with, that they were only for the apostolic age, and then they've died off. Now, the reason I am not is because I do not believe that it is taught in Scripture. In fact, I would tell you, I think Scripture teaches the opposite, 
that the signs, even the miraculous signs of the Holy Spirit are Jesus' inaugurated kingdom that seemingly remain. Furthermore, Paul teaches specifically the churches to earnestly desire the greater gifts. Even in the midst of sharp correction, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, there is sharp correction of the church in Corinth, but he still tells them to earnestly desire the greater gifts. That said, I would classify myself as open but cautious. Much of what we see in the prosperity gospel, word of faith, the charismatic movement is unbiblical, dangerous, and a manipulation of emotions. Let's take for a moment the notion of healing. Does God, can God heal? Does he even give people the gift of healing? Yes. But is healing a guarantee? Is it always God's will to heal? No. Paul had a thorn in his flesh, certainly some physical ailment that he knew God could heal. And he prayed three times for God to remove it. And God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. In other words, Paul, it's not my will to heal you. Not to mention a number of people in the New Testament like Timothy who are sick and they're not healed. But isn't there healing in the atonement? This is always the question. Isn't there healing in the atonement? Yes, there is complete healing in the atonement. What Jesus accomplished on the cross is complete healing. He does not need to go back to the cross and die again for complete healing later. But listen to me, that complete healing will come in the final consummation. When Jesus returns, here's the, here's the proof. Jesus also conquered death. But last I checked, every faith healer has died. To misunderstand this is to completely misunderstand that there are certain aspects of the kingdom that have already come, and there are still aspects of the kingdom that have not yet come but waits the final end. As Paul says in Romans 8, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, but still groan in anticipation for the final consummation. Now, let me also say this adamantly. I oppose a second baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is taught that you Get the Holy Spirit at salvation, but one also needs to receive the Holy Spirit in order to receive giftings of the Holy Spirit, especially the gift of tongues. Now, this is dangerous. Why? Well, here's the deal. Upon salvation, every genuine believer has the full, permanent, indwelling Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9. So you cannot receive what you already have. That teaching leads to lots of confusion, even raising doubts in terms of, uh, am, I, am I really saved? In this sense, the Bible speaks in a fixed category. If you are a born again believer, you have the Holy Spirit. That said, that does not limit that the Bible also speaks and commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit which is not talking about a second baptism of the Holy Spirit, but rather is talking about a third, a fourth, a fifth, that over and over again, the New Testament believer is also commanded to fill up on the Holy Spirit. I will refer back to this at the end. So with that aside, I want us to be able to come to God's word with excitement about what he has for us, anticipation of for what God has given to us. Let me state it plainly. I want as much Holy Spirit blessing in my life and the life of our church that he will pour out. And I would hate, I 
fear to come to the end of my days, to stand face to face with Jesus and Jesus say, this is all that I wanted to give to you, but you were unwilling. So may we not be unwilling. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father, we come to your word We wanna be taught by you. We know that your Holy Spirit has been poured out and indwells us. And we have the awesome honor and privilege of gathering together to sing your word, to preach your word, to pray your word, to partake in the Lord's Supper this morning and that your spirit fills us. We pray that you would quicken our minds in an incredible way this morning that we would know more about you and the plans that you have for us. We pray all of that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm only gonna, I'm gonna read some verses that highlight the overall teaching. And then I'm gonna come back and and explain the context of what's going on. So, So that I can keep your mind up here, you may think I'm jumping around, but watch on the screen or I'll call out the verses I want you to be able to to see the higher common teaching that's occurring here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So look at verse one. Now concerning spiritual gifts, they had previously written to Paul and he is uh, setting up the topic again and reminding them of that, okay? Now skip down to verse four. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. I want you to really focus on, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Verse 11, but to one and the same Spirit works all things distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. All right, so point number one. Every believer is given spiritual gifts. There are two words that are translated spiritual gifts. Uh, spiritual gifts. Pneumatica, uh, which if you know any Greek, pneuma is spirit. This means spiritual manifestations or experiences where the spirit shines through. And charisma, also, uh, if you know Greek, the word uh, charis or charis is grace. And so this word, charisma, charisma is grace gifts. Those two words, pneumatica and charisma. In other words, now that a believer is dwelt with the Holy Spirit, There are particular instances or giftings where the Holy Spirit shines through in a special, extraordinary, effective way. And these are called spiritual gifts. Does that make sense? Certain areas in your life where the Spirit shines through in an extraordinary, effective way. Now, there are a number of New Testament passages that speak on this subject, and some of them give example lists. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4. A few important highlights from those lists. Every list is different, meaning the lists are not to be taken as exhaustive. In other words, how the Spirit shows up and enhances each believer is different and is as different as each and every one of us. There might be helpful categories like administrative gifts, but the possibilities are endless. You might love computers, and once the Holy Spirit indwells you, that gift could be enhanced on a whole new level and show up in areas of your life. Now, I pick that topic, computers, or that idea to show you that they're not all spiritual categories. Furthermore, God loves variety. 
And the one who gives the uniqueness to every snowflake of a snowstorm does the same in each of us. Second, these enhancements occur in both natural and supernatural abilities. Many gifts listed like teaching, leadership, serving, administration are common to all men. So my favorite teacher in high school was not a believer, but he still could teach. While other gifts are supernatural, like prophecy and healing. Now, there's no reason to assume that a spiritual gift would take someone who has no natural ability and suddenly make that their superpower, although God could if he wanted. You've all heard the story of the kid who broke his arm and went to the doctor. He was in a cast and asked the doctor, doctor, am I going to be able to play baseball, hit home runs and be an all-star pitcher? To which the doc replied, Son, in six weeks, you'll be right back out there. He said, good, because I used to stink at baseball. (laughs) Rather, it seems the most common, uh, it seems most common for the Holy Spirit to take something that we already have an ability in and are passionate about, and then in, in that area to shine through with extraordinary effectiveness for God's kingdom. Okay, Paul was already an incredible teacher and theological thinker. You know that? And then he got saved, and then God used him to write so much of the New Testament. So look at this slide, and I want you to pause, and I want you to think about This is helpful for you to think about how you discern your spiritual gifts. Okay, one, do you have ability in that area? Okay, are you able? Are these things you are good at? Heart, is it something you're passionate about? Okay, something you desire uh, to spend time and to work in. And then three, is there affirmation by the church, by other people around you? Are other people experiencing God through your giftings in this area? So this morning, I want to free you up to try different areas, areas that you're not automatically going to know. I mean, it's not like when you got saved, you also got a letter in the mail that said these are your spiritual gifts. Rather, there has to be some exploration. And in reality, those giftings will change over time, at least in how you use them. There are seasons of gifting and ministry in life. So you need the freedom to change seats on the bus and to try things out and to figure out, oh, that's not quite my gifting. I'm gonna move over here. Now, I also don't mean this to minimize the supernatural. So let's go back to healing for a moment. I believe that there are times where I've been a part of healing prayer. I'm going to tell a quick story. Uh, about eight years ago, uh, I went on a mission trip to Guatemala. I was an emergency fill-in, um, and so I went, uh, the pastor with the youth group, uh, to Guatemala. And if you've ever been on, on uh, mission trips, you know there, there is one key word that's used at the beginning of every mission trip, and that is you must stay flexible, right? And so... Uh, With this particular mission trip, uh, I got roped into digging a very, very large hole. That was a six foot wide circular by eight foot deep hole. Uh, They needed to bury a septic tank. And if you've ever had to dig a hole like this, uh, you know it is quite some work, all right? Um, So I was spending days digging this hole, and suddenly I'm in the bottom of this hole, I'm covered with lots of dirt. And the pastor of the churches that we were working with, he taps me on the shoulder. He says, pastor, come with me. We need to go pray for someone. So I'm like, you see how disgusting I am? He's like, just come on. And so I get out and we begin to, to walk. We're, we're in very impoverished, very remote part of Guatemala. We begin to walk out, uh, way out and, and 
approached this really shack of a home, very impoverished conditions. Along the way, I asked him, what are we going to do? I remember this uh, because he tells me uh, she has malaria. Now, I remember this because because I was an emergency fill-in on this uh, mission trip, I had not gotten any of my malaria uh, shots ahead of time. So I was a little nervous about this because now I'm going to someone's house to pray over them who has malaria. Uh, And all right, here I go. Uh, So we get there and uh, it's a lady probably in her 50s is very noticeably sick. I mean, fever-pitched, entirely red, sweating, shaking. And she comes out on the front of her porch and the, the pastor begins to tell me that she's the only believer in her household, that she takes care of her ailing husband and uh, her grandson, who also has some health conditions and some problems, that her daughter has, has run off and is with another guy. And she is the only believer in this household I'm surrounded by adject poverty. It's incredibly, really low conditions. And I realized that this this lady has no ability to provide for herself, to get medical care or any of those such things. And right there on the front, front porch, me and the pastor just began to pray with her. And all I can tell you was it was an incredible moment in my life where I genuinely sensed the presence of God in a very powerful way. The pastor prayed in Spanish, I prayed in English, but we prayed over her and my heart cried out for her in a unique, special way. Because God, if you do not heal her, what other option does she, she is holding her, the whole family is, the weight is on her. God, would you please, in your mighty kindness, would you heal her? Well, we left, and the next day, I went back to digging my hole, and, uh, uh, but also that next morning, uh, there was, the, the, the church nearby was, was giving away a bunch of clothes. And there I am in the bottom of my hole digging again. And the pastor comes over, taps me on the shoulder and looks, is, looks up and points to a lady and says, do you see her? And I say, well, who's that? He says, that's the lady we prayed over yesterday. He says, her testimony is that the moment we prayed over her, the fever broke and left. And she's right there this morning. Now, praise God. I could tell you a dozen stories like that. I do not believe that I have the gift of healing, but rather I am just doing what scripture commands. Call the pastors, lay hands on them, and we as uh, the people of God are called to pray for healing. And I have seen God answer prayers of healing. Not every time. You got to keep that in mind. So here's what I would propose to you, that someone who has the gift of healing simply means that God answered their prayers more often with more effectiveness. It's not guaranteed healing that's promised from the scripture. Ultimate healing is promised when Jesus returns. But scripture is filled with a command in the press to pray and to ask for God to do things that only God can do and to trust him in his will. Secondly, and really important from this context of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, spiritual gifts are not for individual pride, but corporate edification. Okay, the context of 1 Corinthians. What seems apparent about the situation in Corinth is that the church was divided over the issue of supernatural spiritual gifts and specifically tongues. Now, the tongues mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 are similar but different from what occurred in Acts 2 at Pentecost. On Pentecost, they were speaking in foreign languages, and it was a miraculous sign for unbelievers who hear the praises of God in their native tongues. But if you pay attention to 1 Corinthians 12, the tongues are being used for personal edification like a private prayer language, and they are not being understood and they are in need of an interpreter. 
And they are instructed by Paul to control the use of that tongue in the church setting. Now, as you could imagine, in any church, when stuff like this goes on, you end up dividing into two camps, all right? Those who are excited about what's going on and those who have pressed to this side and say, you gotta stop that, okay? You ever been a part of churches? Yes. Now, Paul gives a stern correction, but as I've pointed out, he does not discredit the gifts. Instead, he spends these three chapters making this overall point, look at verse seven, but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. That is that your spiritual gift has been given to you for us. You have been gifted to be a blessing, not for self-promotion or pride. In Corinth, individuals made themselves the focus. Whether it was in worship or in discussion or in times of prayer, they would pop up, they would speak in tongues with no benefit to anyone but to show themselves spiritual. They were abusing the gift, twisting it, prideful manipulation. Now, the context is different. In, in 1 Corinthians, Paul is cleaning that up, but there are many truths that apply today, beginning with your, F-E-C, your spiritual gift has been given to you for us. You have been gifted to be a blessing, not for self-promotion and not for pride. So let me state it even more clearly. You have been gifted to be a blessing here at First Baptist Burning. Next, if you look at verses 12 through 26 and you see the picture that Paul paints, he goes into this extended analogy that we are a body. And just like a body has many parts, has hands and elbows and gallbladders and the uvula, you know, that's that little piece that hangs down in the back of your throat, okay? That each body part does something different and we need each other. Pause for a second and think about the way that your body functions when your left elbow itches. It doesn't just shake and vibrate itself and take care of itself. A signal goes to the brain. The brain gets sends a signal over to the right hand that says, hey, get over there and scratch your left elbow. Your left elbow needs help. Go scratch it. So it is that we function together as a body. What this means is that no one person has all the gifts of the spirit. Rather, you are given a specialized role. And this also means that we desperately need one another. That not all gifts are uh, equally visible, but all gifts are vitally important. Listen as I read 21 through 26. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seems to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body which deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the members which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another." And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, I need to press this point, this imagery of the body even further, because we're not simply called a body. We are called the body of Christ. Verse 27, that the church is the local living representation of the body of Christ. Look around. That we, filled with the Holy Spirit, are meant to accomplish a mission 
for Jesus Christ right here in Bernie. Now, every church is given the same overall mandate, right? We would call that the Great Commission. Uh, we are called to reach the lost and make disciples. But what it looks like in every local church is different. What specific ministries we are called to and the Spirit gifts us to do are going to be different from Curry Creek. Now, in this area, we typically use the word vision. How has God gifted us and what does he want us to accomplish through his Holy Spirit as Christ's local body? So picture this. I mean, genuinely think about what I'm saying, that we in this room have a mission and special, unique ministry given by the Holy Spirit for how we are supposed to impact Bernie and all that God wants to do beyond. This means we can't accomplish God's work without you. We, all, we are a body. We need elbows and feet and ears or children's workers and greeters and teachers and those who work in the kitchen and on and on. That we are not going to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish without you. And yet when we look at the landscape of American Christianity, we find that in most churches, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. We're overrun with consumerism. The Lone Ranger Christian says, I don't need a church. I'm sufficient on my own. As if an I could say he doesn't need the body. So here's the deal. As your pastor, and even if you're visiting, God is calling you to be an active member of a local church, to bear fruit through your spiritual giftings. Otherwise, the church will not accomplish all that it is tasked. And my final point is that this will not happen without your intentional effort. The Holy Spirit is not going to overpower you and control your will. The Bible says that he can be resisted, he can be quenched, and he can be grieved, like turning down a radio knob. You can turn down the Holy Spirit. Jesus, forgive us when we do that. Instead, you have to remember that the Holy Spirit is a person that we are called to engage and to participate with in ministry. This means that your spiritual gifts must be sought and developed. Again, you're not going to receive a letter in the mail. And they will vary in different seasons of life. They aren't magic. Okay, to put this in video game terms, I won't always have level 90 preaching ability, okay? That's not how it works, right? I've been working on my preaching and teaching for years through lots of critique, through uh, watching others who preach and teach well. And it, in all honesty, I'm way better now than what I was five years ago. And here's what I would tell you, that through that hard work and preparation, I find the Holy Spirit meets with me as I not only prepare sermons, but also as I deliver them. Bearing fruit, hopefully you would give testimony, bearing fruit in your life. So now I say to you that you have an obligation to develop your spiritual gifts, an obligation to yourself and to our church that we will not accomplish all that God has for us without you. So in your pew, when you walked in, there was a card that has a QR code on that. There's also a link. This is a spiritual gift Assessment. It's called shape. It takes in, into account your personality, your experiences, your areas of interest. We are asking everyone across the church to take this test. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on your home computer. We actually have hand printout copies. If you just don't do that technology thing, that's fine. Now, this is just a tool used to help you 
It is not the gospel. It is a tool to try and help you. But I wanna close and I wanna ask you a few important questions. Do you know how God has gifted you? And do you know how you currently fit into the mission of First Baptist Bernie? Are you willing to humble yourself and ask Jesus to show you afresh? There may be things that you need to let go of in order to say yes to God using you in your spiritual giftings? Are you willing to re-engage? Some of you may think that Bernie is your retirement place and therefore you are in your retirement season of church, that your usefulness is done. It's just not true, not in the least bit. Will you be willing to pray that the Spirit would show you how you are gifted in this season and how you are supposed to be working and edifying the whole body? Will you pray with me? Jesus, we surrender to you. We bow the knee of our heart We long to be used by you in the local church through our giftings to be a part of your mission. To see you accomplish things that only you can do. That we would rejoice, that we would sing hallelujah. Thank you for giving our lives purpose and mission that you would use a wretch like me. That you would give our lives such meaning and giftedness to be your hands and your feet. God, we want all that you have for us. Forgive us for resisting your Holy Spirit and not seeking our spiritual gifts. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to walk out with the purpose that you have for us as a church. We pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen.